You are listening to TMI for the week of January 22nd, 2018. Today, Dave speaks to activist Janet McNeil. For updates and contact information, find her website, durhamnuclearawareness.com. We spoke to her ahead of several public meetings she will be speaking at in the near future. Look for related links in our show notes. How did you get interested in the nuclear issue in Ontario? Kind of happened by fluke. Um, I used, I spent most of my adult life living in Durham region, kind of oblivious to the nuclear plants. It's one of the things that I notice about people who live in Durham region or Toronto, actually, that people are so oblivious to these two gigantic nuclear facilities just east of Toronto. But I was friends with people who had coordinated the Nuclear Awareness Project group and Durham Nuclear Awareness, and I mean Dave Martin and Irene Koch. These people were personal friends of mine, and um, pesticides for many years, waste. Waste was the first issue that I got involved in, recycling all that stuff. And then many years on pesticides, and I worked on uh, cancer prevention. I moved up to Deep River at one point and spent six years living up there. And when I lived up there, I worked on the Well Aware Project, I guess, and energy conservation, cancer prevention, the run, walk, and roll for cancer prevention. And I was migrating towards working on climate issues. That's what I really intended to do. That was my plan. I did have a plan. I was going to move my energy into being a climate activist. Um, But while I lived in Deep River, I got to know these two people who worked on, who did a lot of work on, uh, there's a tritium light or a tritium facility in Pembroke. It's called SRB. And they did a lot of work on that over the years. And in 2006, I remember this well, because it really changed the trajectory of my life, I guess. Although it wasn't obvious immediately, but I went to a CNSC hearing with them and it just completely blew my mind. You know, within 15 minutes of of being in that hearing room, I could tell that this was a pretty crazy process, this uh, Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission licensing process. So, So that was 2006, and then I didn't really do anything much more than... I did write a couple of angry letters to the CNSC starting right off at the start. I was quite naive about how everything operated. Oh, I know. In 2010, and I was back in southern Ontario by then, but there was an SRB hearing coming up, an SRB licensing hearing. This is the Tritium Mm -hmm. facility in Pembroke. Licensing hearing in 2010, and um, I just felt obliged to be involved in it. So I dove in deeply on that one, and, uh, and then... And then that was, you know, crazy and exhausting. And Now, what was the issue at that Pembroke tritium plant? Well... Because um, one of these tritium companies, they dumped, um, is it the largest dump of tritium ever or something? And the fines that were, last I heard of it, they were basically just given a tap on the wrist. And they had dumped a huge amount of tritium at this very small company that was involved in making uh, exit signs or something. Is that the... Well, I'm not sure if that was SRB or not. I'm not sure if SRB was ever fined. There is an, there was another tritium facility in, in Peterborough at mm. the airport, and it, sh- it got shut down because mm. there was a lot of opposition to it. But uh, the facility in Pembroke released to air and water massive amounts of tritium and I'm not a good numbers person so I'm not the right person to talk to about that if you really wanted to dig in on that I certainly know who you can talk to and these are these friends of mine from well Pembroke and Ottawa Um, but what happened was the company was applying for a five-year license and of course they got their five-year license because this is what I've learned over the years after attending many many CNSC hearings they might as well have written the license before the hearing took place the hearings are pure theater. I think I heard somebody else use that phrase recently. They're pure theater. That's all they are. It's a play. It's all a play. You know, they have this thing they have to do. They're supposedly the regulator of nuclear activities, and they hold these public hearings, and we get our opportunities to speak, although they've even shortened those, you know, um, 
the most you can get is 10 minutes now even if even if they have funded you to pay for three experts to come say to present at a hearing you get 10 minutes they may have given you tens of thousands of dollars to hire three experts to talk about waste for example but you're only going to get 10 minutes to speak at the hearing the sort of exception to that is if they and this is something that I've watched very closely so when I present they just you know shuffle me off the stage as quickly as possible now that could be because of the nature of my presentation but when other people like Sean Patrick Stencil presents it can go on for three hours because they don't include your 10 minutes isn't really their supplemental interaction no. with no no the the q and a can go on a long time that can go on indefinitely so if you they want, want it to you want to design your presentation so that you get more airtime i guess well, I've had both experiences. Mm. I've had experiences where I was asked a number of questions and I, you know, was pretty happy with the amount of time I was given. That would be the last Darlington hearing. Maybe we were talking about emergency planning and that was a decent thing. But I presented at a, a deep geologic repository joint review panel and I said some really damning things. I said, I just, you know, and I actually saw... The person who led that panel hand a sticky note, a post-it note, across the table where the panel was sitting, and I'm pretty sure I know what was on that post-it note, and it was, don't ask any questions. I noticed that during those hearings, once you have presented, you become a group of people that can, um, there's something different about it. Um, Once... Once you present, can't you hang around afterwards and be included in the conversation somehow? Well, it's not really a conversation, but you can ask questions. So if you haven't presented, I mean, a person cannot walk in off the street, say, at a CNSC hearing and Mm. ask a question. But if you have been, you know, if you're an intervener, as they call it. Right. <clears throat> when when it comes time for general questions, I'm trying to think when they yeah, do that. How did that, that but work? Because I you, don't now know. You, come on. No, I'm, I'm right. serious. And it's different. There was a different setup at the JRP hearings than the normal. Ah, that's what it is. It's the joint review panel ones then. Yeah. Because at a regular hearing, you don't get a chance to ask questions. Now, uh, I, that must how be it. Does that, that work? Was... So let's see. So could it be another intervener? So Sean Patrick Stencil makes a presentation, and then the review panel gets to ask maybe questions, and then Sean Patrick Stencil sort of is obligated to hang around and continue to bat answers and more questions back and forth. If mm-hmm. The panel might ask a question about how he derived his conclusion or something, and the thing might get batted around for a while. But then... You get to, as a fellow no. presenter, ask no. Sean Patrick a question? No. Or is it no. when the opposition is? Or you, how? I think you may be right that it's that? only at the joint review panel hearings, yeah. and I've yeah. only been to a couple of those. I was at the joint review panel on the Darlington New Build in 2011, and then the DGR joint review panel in, I think, fall of 2013. Um but no, at a regular licensing hearing, mm-hmm. that just doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. So at a regular licensing hearing, it's just you make your presentation to the panel. The mm-hmm. panel asks you questions if they feel like it or mm-hmm. doesn't ask you questions if they feel like it. Mm-hmm. And then they move on to the next. But at a interviewer. JRP, what was the difference at, at Bruce JRP? I didn't that... go to that one, so I don't know. Oh, I thought you said you had no, been to that No, not one. the Bruce one. Okay. OPG. Well, the DGR was... JPR, JRP, the DGR, <laughs> the OPG, DGR, JRP, Joint Review Pass. I know, it's ridiculous. Did you I have to never been one? to a Bruce hearing. I have not been okay. to a Bruce hearing. I've watched some of it. In the group that I'm involved with now, Durham Nuclear Awareness, we focus a lot on nuclear emergency planning. So I would watch, say, if I know Teresa McClanahan is presenting on emergency planning at a Bruce hearing, I will watch that portion of the hearing live, you know, on the webcast, but uh, I've never actually been to a Bruce hearing. I usually don't miss a second of a uh, televised uh, online webcast. like torture to me. Well, the big ones, any ones that are public interaction, 
the Darlington ones and the the Bruce DGR hearings. I found them very interesting. Some interesting things get said. There's no question about that. Some really interesting things get said. Even and on then... Twitter. So if you're on Twitter, there's there could be someone, sometimes me, promoting, you know, watch live now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, I've seen it covered the way the CBC should be covering it, where someone's going to say, and speaking now, and give the name and what they're hitting the points on, and, you know, coming up next, or, you know, we're going to break, like, actual, um, what do they call it in sports when there's somebody giving the play-by-play, uh, and it gets people... Because sometimes See, all you need to know is that it's on and you could watch it. And I've problem, always found it fascinating. The problem with the whole damn process is, as I said at the beginning, the ink is dry on that damn license anyway. Before Correct. you all walked into the room. They've already made their decision. Well, the last one was for 13 years. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it just gets longer and longer. So, for example, my first, the first hearing that I was ever an intervener at was the SRB hearing in 2010. And the company was asking for a five-year license. They got their five-year license. Five years later, what did they ask for? A ten, uh, they asked for a 13-year license, I think, and were given 10. It's all a bit of a game, right? But the licenses have gone up. They've multiplied, and it's happening crazy in the States. They're giving licenses for decades. You know, old plants. There's they're tr- going to wind up being 80 years old before they, well, There's the a th- human race will probably be extinct before these plants run through their licenses. This rate. It's, yeah, um, it's the, pretty crazy. There's a three letter acronym for another technique they have, which is to combine the license to build with the license to operate. And this way they get around having. Mm. There's a, well, whatever combined, crazy things they're doing in the States, we'll wind up doing it here too. Although I don't think there's going to be any new nuclear quite frankly. We, yeah. We are not going to have any new nuclear reactors in Canada. It's not going to happen. Well, just in the last few days, um, a Canadian company apparently bought Westinghouse. Oh, really? Which had bankrupted yeah. itself. Um, a Canadian company bought Westinghouse. Yeah, but here's the deal: is <clears throat> apparently, and this is just you know the rumor. Um, Westinghouse isn't going to pursue any more new builds. It's going to focus on decommissioning, which I could not oh. believe. I well, was there's reading. money to be made. Sure. There's always money to be made. Yeah, people have been suggesting that for a long time that they should get into that. But um, So my the reason why that's interesting is because Westinghouse was one of the companies that was going to build two new reactors at Darlington's site. And it is the contractor that's building uh, reactors in South Carolina, which was just canceled after wasting $9 billion of repairs yeah. money. Uh, but the punchline to the story is that the reactor build Vogel in Georgia is still going ahead, apparently, although everybody's expecting that it would be canceled. But it's the same Westinghouse AP-1000 reactor. So if they're not pursuing any more new builds, isn't that a new build? And is that really going to get canceled? Well, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm not... I don't even attempt to read the tea leaves. All I know is that if a... Well, OPG, let's call it OPG, Ontario Power Generation. If they apply for a license to the CNSC, they're going to get their license. Hmm. That's all I know. And I even know somebody who wrote them last year and basically got that confirmed in writing. This person wrote to the CNSC and said, you know, do you ever turn down licenses? And the answer was basically, no, we don't. Every time somebody applies for a license. Now, there have been occasions when... A license has been, for example, for SRB in Pembroke. My friends were incredible watchdogs on the tritium emissions there. And one time SRB was shut down for a while. I believe it was shut down. It may have been for as long as 18 months at one point. This was because the tritium emissions were astronomical. But so occasionally a license in, you know, Pickering in 2013, because of the nature of all the information, a lot of which was provided by Sean Patrick Stencil at Greenpeace, they did a hold point, right? They said they wouldn't give a license right away, so then they had a hearing. They had a, quotes hold point mm-hmm. hearing the following year, and then, of course, they proceeded to relicense them just as we knew they would. For a 13-year. Yeah, yeah. So the thing that is really aggravating 
doing this work is we know we can't win. We cannot win. It's called the military industrial complex. Okay, no. That's I, what we're working on here. And I asked another activist just recently in Australia, I was trying to describe at least my experience, but being an activist, there is this swing from two extremes. One, completely hopeless. Billions have been paid to install this thing I'm fighting and you can't we're all told we can't fight City Hall. And the opposite end of that swing is this sort of sense that, you know, we're intelligent beings, everything needs to make some kind of sense, and you have a righteous indignation at things that don't make sense. So you swing from one ex- one extreme of it's hopeless to another extreme that how can we sit idly by and watch this happen? Yeah, absolutely. That's kind of a difficult thing. Most yeah. people aren't really actually, they're not tackling that kind of involvement. And maybe they aren't capable of it. Maybe it's a very, maybe a lot of activists aren't capable of it. I think we're nuts. (laughs) We're all nuts for sticking with it. Sure. Me among them. I mean, I've been doing, I've been an activist for, sometimes I, I have even miscalculated that and forgotten that I basically started being a community activist when my now 34 year old daughter was one year old. It wasn't environmental stuff at that point. It was different things. But I sort of escalated along the way, too. And I suppose the reason I stayed involved at the beginning was I had some successes, you know. But um, it's hard to have a success with the with the nuclear stuff. But I'm still going. I get burnt out. I do get burnt out. Every hearing I go to burns me out really badly. And my friends and relatives are used to me now. I always say, oh, yeah, I'm going to quit. This is it. I'm done. This is the last hearing. I'm going to quit. I'm not going to do this work anymore. And then I give myself a bit of a break, and I come back to it. What what burns you out? Is it the preparation, or is it the presentation? Well, it's a lot of work, so you do get sort of tired and worn out. But it's... You know what it is? I'm, I can't stand phoniness and hypocrisy. And the hearings are nothing but theater, as previously stated. So you go and you, you, know, you spend three or four days. The hearings keep getting longer because more and more people keep intervening. More and more work gets done to flush people out of the woodwork and, and there are more and more interveners. And that is energizing, seeing that. I mean, I can get quite excited. I can have a great day at a hearing because of all the great people who've presented. But listening to the authorities, I'm going to a hearing in a couple of weeks up in Pembroke. And at the very beginning of the first day will be, um, who will be first? What do you call them now? CNL, CRL? I get a bit confused because I used to live up there and we just called it ACL then or Chalk River or whatever. Canadian National Labs? It'll or? be CNL presenters first and then the CNSC staff will present. And you know what? I'm not going for that. I know not to go and listen to that stuff because that's what drains me. It's listening to that stuff. So many lies, so much BS. I can't stand it. But there are going to be a lot of fantastic people presenting at that hearing. So that will be energizing. But anyway, so I get burnt out. And then, and then, you know that the other thing about activism, it's like, it's become my family, really. It's become my tribe. You know what I mean? Um, I'm not just colleagues with my fellow activists. I'm really good friends with some of them, like, and it's, you, you You begin to be, well, it's, I don't know how to say it other than that it's a tribe, really. And, you know. Wouldn't comedians hang out with comedians? Yeah. It's the same. Yeah, thing. yeah. How do you fit into Durham Nuclear Awareness? Well, I coordinate the group. Um, that all happened kind of by fluke, too. Everything happens by fluke. Uh, the group was dormant for a lot of years and I mean along the way Irene died unfortunately Irene died New Year's Eve 2001 in a car accident tragic we were 
all devastated when Irene died. I think the group had gone quiet already by then, though. I guess the group started up again early 2012. And it happened really as a result of the Fukushima accident, I suppose you could say in a way, because a bunch of us started seeing one another at that um, Darlington New Build hearing that was held in March and April of 2011, which, you know, that hearing began right after the Fukushima accident had begun. I don't, I mean, because that, I say it that way because that accident's going on forever. But a bunch of us got together and um, somebody contacted me and asked what was happening in Durham region. Was, you know, was there a group active? And then I met with somebody else who'd been in the group and and he said, we could start DNA up again. And I went, yeah, okay. And I was living in Durham region at that point too. Yikes. I feel like this, these earphones are. So we started the group again. And we... We're going to have to tie your hands. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we started the group up again in 2012, early 2012. And we focused mostly on emergency planning nuclear emergency planning. And we worked closely with CELA, Canadian Environmental Law Association, and Greenpeace, Sean Patrick Stencil and Teresa McClanahan. They're our experts, kind of. They're the ones who, they're the ones who are really, really, really knowledgeable about emergency planning and what needs to be done. And so, yeah, so we've been working on that six years now. Yeah, so I coordinate the group, and there are people in the group who were involved in it back when when it was in its early days with Irene and Dave. And we talk to politicians, hold public meetings, intervene at hearings, and yeah. Are you fighting a particularly vicious battle when you're operating in the region that's getting all these host payments and a lot of the people who live there work in the industry or know somebody who does. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, the way I look upon it is, I, I don't know if I should say these things, but it's like Durham Region is a wholly owned subsidiary of Ontario Power Generation. I used to say that about General Motors because at one time and that's what it was like in Durham Region. When I first became an activist, I was concerned about the emissions from cars and I would talk about that and I kind of got shut down because everybody in Durham Region worked for General Motors at the time or so it seemed. But it's not just Durham Region, it's Ontario. You know, Ontario is owned and run by the nuclear industry. That's my opinion. Not just the nuclear industry. I mean, other industries, I guess, too. But I, I don't really want to admit this to myself, but I mean, you know, we're surrounded by obvious plants, but what we're not aware of is all the transfer points, all the depots, the processing plants and sites, the mine sites, storage sites, intermediary sites where they, they're shipping stuff to and, and there is no plan for where it will go from there, but often it gets shipped towards Bruce. NWMO, Nuclear Waste Management. Yep. The thing is, Dr. Gordon Edwards, who's been working on nuclear issues for like, I don't know, 40 years or Ooh, something. Who I'm trying like to get on the show. Yeah, he's... Tap, tap, tap. Is this on? <laughs> Gordon knows so much. Gordon calls this the age of nuclear waste, and, and he's bang on about this, because it's just the amount of stuff that's going on right now well, when did we think that it was going to become a problem? Because we've been piling the stuff up. Well, and activists have been saying problem. it for yeah. decades, right? Well, activists have been saying it for decades. Shut the plants down because, you know, we have no way to deal with this waste. And now we're at this point where it's just like nuclear waste here, nuclear waste there, nuclear waste, mm -hmm. nuclear waste everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's on the roads. It's, it's at the plants right beside Lake Ontario or whatever body of water it happens to be beside. So many nuclear plants are right by the water and the waste is right by the water and there's nowhere for it to go. Down in the States, they're trying to resurrect Yucca Mountain of all things. And, you know, it's just, there's no solution for this waste. So 
I say this on every show, so which I probably shouldn't, but again, at the Bruce hearings for the OPG DGR, they were citing um, installations like WIP as world examples. Oh, yeah. IAEA accredited best practices. Wasn't it during that hearing that the that WIP blew up and problems developed? And it's like, and, yeah. come on, people. Or Hanford, no... or oh, Hanford, or mm. Mark, or anywhere else that they're trying it. That it, you know, okay. it's bad. It's really bad. What is coming up? What hearings are coming up in May? Is it May or June? June, end of June, I think, or towards the end of June. Pickering, Ontario Power Generation is asking for a ten-year license to keep the Pickering reactors going for ten years. Well, no, they're supposedly going to keep them going until 2024, I think it is, and then they're going to start working on the decommissioning. I think that's the idea. And the idea. whole point of that, and there's an irony here, so presumably these people wouldn't act now to refurb Darlington unless taking you know used reactors down and refurbishing them was an important thing. So there is a little bit of an irony in that the reason why there's hearings for Pickering is because they want to keep a power plant open longer than it was supposed to have been running because when they take down Darlington to refurb it, they need that power from Pickering. Well, supposedly they need it. I mean, so I'm you're not... extending the life of one plant, uh, denying that you know refurbishment and or shutdown has a timetable, to do that very thing to Darlington. Well, I think they want to keep running the plants because they make a lot of money. They make a lot of money selling power. Wasn't Pickering supposed to be shut down a few years ago? It's been supposed to be shut down quite a number of times. I don't even keep track of all that. So How many they... times it was supposed to be shut down and they kept going. So now, now it's just I'm completely skeptical about everything they say. You know, so they say they want to run them till 2024. Well. What will they say in 2020? I mean, we can't really believe what they say. And I've said that to them. I, I'm i quite amused and and proud of how but it doesn't I took add them up. on you one know, time. But. You know what I'm saying, right? Like, you know the last thing they want to do is spend a dollar doing anything they don't have to do. But it's really, really been urgent and obvious that Darlington needs to be refurbed, like, right away. So, but it's okay to take these Pickering reactors and leave them running longer than they were supposed to be running? Like, Yeah, and you know what? That's, that's one of those matters that I don't really understand. I'm not technical on that. I know there's Pickering A and Pickering B, and there's two reactors that got shut down at Pickering, and there was some massive, massive overrun. They were trying to refurb them at one point, and there was a massive cost overrun, and they wound up shutting them down. I, d I don't pretend to really understand what these people are up to totally now maybe this is propaganda but i i remember hearing that and don't quote me on this but it was as if pickering a and b each which have four reactors but i thought i heard that pickering b was costing them twice the amount of money they to run them i don't know and pickering it always costs more it always costs more than they say and the refurbs are always way more expensive than they say they're going to be, and they're delayed always. And okay, SNC Lavalin and AECON, and there they are at the top of the street digging up all our subways, right? Like they get you know, every my, job. My little joke about these companies that have con at the end of them is, mm. yeah, really, mm. <laughs> it's a con for sure. <laughs> SNC Lavalin con. There's um. Yeah, SNC Lavalin. This is it. I mean, we're dealing with really reputable, you know, trustworthy. Weren't they hiding the Gaddafi sons while the Americans were trying to find them during the Gulf War? Or... I don't even know. I don't follow SNC Lavalin. I just know they're kind of shady operators. Let's just put it that way I in a really diplomatic way. Pretty shady. Previous CEOs <laughs> were convicted of uh, bribery. I think that the World Bank banned them from World Bank funded funding projects we are not dealing with uh is it not snc lavalin that's in the middle of the arthur porter scandal i don't know see yeah it's always quite SNC possible lavalin. quite possible they're uh shady operators and they have a whole lot of power 
One of the things I like to say is that the tail wags the dog, you know, as far as the... I mean, a lot of people that I know think the government tells the nuclear industry what to do in Ontario, and I would venture to say that it's the other way around. The nuclear industry tells the government what to do. So the tail is wagging the dog, not the other way around. And... You know, she shrugs or whatever. You know what? Too can bad you do? that it can't come out on the podcast. <laughs> it's not a pretty situation. It's not a pretty situation. So going to one of those hearings, and it's on your own dime, yep. and it affects your work life, and they hold them in the middle of nowhere. Yep. And you deliberate. go there, and there's no place to go buy something to nibble Coffee on. Coffee, even I know. Forget that. I know. Just you're, and if you're nervous already, your stomach's rumbling. And then if you're an active person, you've never sat in a chair for four hours waiting for your turn to come up and all your the you have these to go people through the around. security every time you go in and out of the room too. Yeah. Like But the, what I was finding was that all these bureaucrats sitting at the tables, they sit at desks twenty four hours a day. This is a, a, a great time out of the office for them. The public that's presenting is on t- television it's being recorded it's being translated into two languages it's something outside of their comfort zone it's not maybe always necessarily their expertise yep. other than they're the ones who have to pay for all this stuff yep and there's police the crazy thing we are the taxpayers we are funding we are paying for this whole shindig and we don't even get a cup of coffee i just can't even believe the contempt in essence, with which the public is treated at these spectacles. And I've been to a lot of these damn hearings over the uh, years. I'm here to tell you. I went to one in Chalk River in 2011, I remember. I was was treated with absolute hostility is the wrong word. I don't know what it was by a cop when I got there. And then, you know, they break... And everybody there, everybody else there, and the whole room, there was only... There were only two of us there who were not from the industry or the regulator, regulator in quotes. And they all go to get coffee. We peasants, there's no coffee for us. If you were you know. really trying to present, you could use a little office space to get your act together between, especially if the CNSC is funding you. Why can't you have a tiny little room where with it, where you can use your laptop and, and get your act together and and update your notes in real time or hone your speech or have a place to uh yeah well anyway that's not happening it's it's an intimidating process and that's by design i have a fantastic quote by john goffman about these hearings that i must share at some point this is break time but go ahead now (laughs) if you can if you can rattle it off now go do it well there has not existed the slightest shred of meaningful evidence that the entire intervention process in nuclear energy is anything more than the most callous of charades and frauds. This was Dr. John Goffman, who was both an MD and a PhD, and he was involved in the nuclear business with the Manhattan Project way back in the 40s, I guess. And then as an MD, he learned what the effects of radioactivity were, and he began to dissent, and he dissented hugely. Yeah, but he said it all those decades ago. Yeah, it's theater. The more I I watch of this, and and recently it has only occurred to me recently, uh, but the manufacturing of consent, that's what this is. Mm -hmm. Because they, if they, you know, because when asked, they say, oh, we do lots of consulting, we show, do all these open houses, and we put all this, we don't just invite the public to come and present some people can apply for funding to do so. So they've gone out of their way to include the public. And then when the public comes up, most of the time, the concerns that the public actually have are outside of the scope of the hearing. And so, which is by design, so that your objections, history, politics, geopolitics, military policy, ethics... All, you know, all of those cost. I don't know where to yeah. stop, you know. Yeah, I know. I they're know. outside it's of absurd. the purview it's, of... It's all completely absurd. I have another great quote. <laughs> I don't have to look at my notes for that one. Frank Zappa apparently said, uh, government is the entertainment division of the military-industrial complex. Ain't that a beauty? 
You can check out Durham Nuclear Awareness. You can email us, info at durhamnuclearawareness.com. We're on Facebook. Just check for Durham Nuclear Awareness when you're on Facebook. Our website is durhamnuclearawareness.com, and our Twitter is at Durham Nuke Aware. I didn't even mention emergency planning, which yeah. is the thing that DNA focuses mostly on. Okay. So we've been working on this for six years. Uh, the province came out with a new supposedly revised PNERP, Provincial Nuclear Emergency Response Plan, last year. It was four years overdue. Uh, the previous iteration had been in 2009, and so it's supposed to be done every four years. So it was four years overdue when it came out, and, and the Fukushima accident, we will recall now, is how many years behind us? Seven. We're working up to seven years in the rear of your mirror. And um, so my obvious first question is, so in their emergency preparedness plan, are they considering a worst case scenario or are they looking through the world with rose colored glasses? Looks like they're continuing to look at the world through rose colored glasses, design basis accident. And you know what? I have not read what they've come up with yet. I realized that today. I've got to spend a couple of hours reading. Um, But from what I understand, the summary of my colleagues, uh, it's more of the same, basically. It's more of what it was before. I I came up with a phrase one time, which is, you know, the emergency plans in Durham region are about as much use as wet tissue paper. And I'm not sure that's going to change. You know. The hurricane um, and its evacuations recently, I wonder if there was some learning there. Because... You know, you were having to prompt people to return back to the gas pump station where they work because the people who are evacuating need gas. Or certain roads have to be turned into one ways. Or your the balance between the whole point of, of the government's role is the quick and accurate dissemination of information but you and i both know as soon as everybody hears something's going on we're all gonna we're not gonna all the a's evacuate all the people whose last names start with a b now evacuate that's not how it's going to go there's no way to have a managed evacuation not with the amount of population we're dealing with here we're dealing with a huge population and unfortunately what i think the industry and government have in mind is and I have reasons for believing this. Um, I think they're basically just going to tell everybody shelter in place. Mm-hmm. Most people have never heard the phrase shelter in place. You know, if you went out to Young and Eglinton, the street corner, and asked 100 people, what does shelter in place mean? They'd look at you like you were speaking Swahili. They have no idea what shelter in place means. What it means is close the doors and windows and try not to breathe any more than you have to, and everything will be okay. That's shelter in place. And I think that's what they plan on doing. And one of the reasons I think that is because, and unfortunately I cannot lay my hands on this. As I say, I'm unable to, I have tried to locate this message, and I'm pretty good at finds. I can do finds in all my emails and find things, usually by subject or whatever. I've not been able to lay my hands on this. But basically what the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the U.S. was saying is they're just going to raise the level of allowable radioactivity so that if there's an accident, they can say, oh, well, you know, we're fine. Pshaw, just stay in your house. We're fine because it's not dangerous. So that, I believe, is what what is going to happen. So I don't think anybody's thinking about a real evacuation if there's really serious nuclear accident. That's what I honestly think. I think we're just going to be told to stay in your stay in your house, everything will be fine. And one of the things that Teresa McClanahan has made at, at Canadian <coughs> Environmental Law Association has made us all aware of is that most dwellings in Ontario are not suitable for sheltering in place. They're not, they're wood construction or whatever, and you're really not going to be safe. You're going to be breathing too much radioactivity. So, but I, I don't think there's a real plan to, to to make an evacuation. And Okay. So it was just 25, negative 25 the other day. Yeah. It has been negative 20 for two weeks. So shelter in place. And you're sheltering in place because radionuclides have been pumped into the air. So 
shelter in place, but for how long? And so if that means um, closing your windows, closing your doors, and duct taping off places for air to get in, uh, that's insane in negative 20 degree weather. Um, one of the most incredible things I ever saw watching hearings was the Durham fire marshal made a presentation and he pointed out that you cannot I mean in the building code for every um, device you have in your basement you're supposed to have at least two three inch diameter pipes going outside to deliver air in for your furnace for your oh. hot water you think about it you seal off your house and then you start your furnace or your hot water tank where is it getting the oxygen to burn and the whole act of allowing flu gas to go up a chimney creates a negative pressure, right? That Those fumes will not go up your chimney unless air can get in to relieve that pressure. It goes from outside through your furnace and hot water tank up that little chimney and up. If you technically seal it off, those fumes can't even rise up the chimney. Hmm. So not only aren't they getting air oxygen to burn, these devices, but again, how do you shelter in place? You cannot seal off the fresh air from the outside. And in negative 20 degree weather, how long are you going to survive with no heat? The bottom line really is that um, there's a huge myth operating underneath everything. And that big myth is it can't happen here. It can't happen here. So we just can't happen here. It's not going to happen here. Um, so we don't really have to be prepared for it. And I have this wonderful book called Fukushima, The Story of a Nuclear Disaster by David Lockbaum, Edwin Lyman, Susan Q. Stranahan, and the Union of Concerned Scientists. This book came out, I can't remember when it came out, a couple of years ago. But it details in really minute detail what happened in Fukushima at the Fukushima plant. But it also goes back into the history of nuclear regulation and explains that ever since the Three Mile Island accident in 1979, this has been the operating myth. The operating myth is it can't happen here. So if we say it can't happen here, if we jump up and down enough and say it can't happen here, it won't happen here. But of course, accidents are happening about once every 10 years, major accidents. So it could happen here. But this is what everything is sort of premised on, this this myth of it can't happen here. And one of the reasons we know darn well the nuclear industry knows it can happen here is they do on-site emergency drills at the plant sites five times a year. Five times a year they do on-site drills. So they know it can happen. So don't anybody tell me it can't happen here. They know it can happen. But what most people don't realize is that the nuclear industry, OPG, let's just call it OPG, Ontario Power Generation, is responsible for nuclear emergency planning on site. So OPG is responsible for the nuclear emergency response at the Darlington site, at the Pickering site. The minute you go beyond the fence line, the province is responsible for that. So that's Ministry of Community and I, I get confused because it's kind of this weird juxtas juxtaposition. Ministry of Community Safety and Correctional Services. <laughs> Puzzled look on face. <laughs> and under that, it's OFMEM, the Office of the Fire Marshal and Emergency Management, which used to be called EMO or Emergency Management Ontario. I think maybe they spend most of their energy and their money and their time changing their names or whatever it is. But... Um, so off mem office of the fire marshal and emergency management so the province is responsible for the nuclear emergency response plan but there are so many fingers in the pie with responsibilities on nuclear emergency response it's federal it's provincial it's regional it's municipal it's you name it there are responsibilities at every level i made a presentation once to the durham regional council and i had this slide that showed what the different levels of government involved. It's unbelievable. The crossover, as I say, it's federal and various ministries within federal, various ministries within provincial, 
various levels of regional, municipal, whatever. So the immediate thing that I see when I look at that, when I look at that list of who all's involved, it's like, oh my God, are there ever a lot of cracks for things to fall between. Wow. And that's what happens when an emergency happens. And it happened in Quebec last winter. I think it was last winter. There was a big snowstorm in Quebec and people were stuck on the highways and the emergency response was really inefficient and somebody wound up getting fired later because, you know, so-and-so hadn't communicated properly with so-and-so. And, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a problem. It's a real problem. I saw it illustrated very slightly at the uh, OPG DGR hearings at Bruce. There was the Ministry of Mining, the Ministry of Fisheries... Uh, the Minister of Environment, the Ministry of Health, well, that's what resources. That's what it's like with nuclear emergency planning. I wish I'd thought to print up a copy of that. It's, it's, it's just wild how many people are involved. I now communicate. Um, I'm a pesky sort of person. I send emails to people like the politicians in Durham Region, and I now send them to some of the politicians in Toronto too because I figure politicians in Toronto need to pay attention to this because like... The Pickering nuclear plant, this is one of the things that I've realized most, well, since I moved to Toronto, I suppose. I spent most of my life in Durham Region, but I live closer to the Pickering reactors now, living in the east end of Toronto. I live in the beaches near the uh, water treatment plant, way out east on Queen Street, from which you can see on a clear day the Pickering nuclear complex, not making that up. It's miles and miles down the shoreline, but you can see it. That's how close it is to Toronto. We live in the backyard. In Toronto, we live in the backyard of this gigantic nuclear plant. And then we're also pretty damn close to that other gigantic nuclear plant at Darlington. Now, forget that. The prevailing wind largely has us downwind from Bruce. Yeah, that too. Yeah, for sure. And they have an incinerator where they regularly burn low-level nuclear waste. I know. Waste. Isn't that lovely? And we get to burn Burning nuclear waste. That's high-tech, green, clean. Yeah, I know. Yeah. It's insanity. It's okay. all insanity. There's Forget one other that. thing I want to say about nuclear emergency planning, though. Oh. I attended a meeting um, October 2016. OPG had a meeting in Pickering. This was to talk to the public about their new plan for uh, asking for a 10-year license for the license extension. So they hosted these meetings. They did it again a year later. I didn't manage to attend the year later, but I did attend in October of 2016 a meeting. There was a presenter from the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. There was a, a moderator or whatever who ran the meeting from Ontario Power Generation. They had Toronto Office of Emergency Management there. They had the Ontario, you know, OFMEM, the Office of the Fire Marshal and Emergency Management people there. They had people from the DEMO, Durham Emergency Management Office. I asked a question about emergency planning because most people don't really understand the issue of emergency planning. They don't understand that it's predicated on there being only a minor accident so that the plans are not very, shall we say, sophisticated, you know, in the event that there's a serious accident. And I think everybody wants good emergency planning. I've said that to politicians in Durham Region, you know, I am... I am passionately anti-nuclear. I'm not going to hide that from anybody. That is, I'm passionately anti-nuclear. And you may not be. But, you know, what we can agree on is we want some decent emergency planning so that if there is an emergency, you know, we've got, we've got proper plans in place. So I asked a question about nuclear emergency planning at this meeting that was hosted by OPG and the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. And the question got tossed over to somebody from Toronto Office of Emergency Management who didn't say a whole lot, kind of, well, we're working on that, whatever. And then it got tossed to the fellow, the staff person who was there from the provincial ministry, OFMEM, Office of the Fire Marshal Emergency Management. And what he said, I wrote it down in a notebook. I was, anyway, what he said was, we've always been very upfront about the, uh, the fact that it's up to the public to be prepared a hush fell over the entire room when he said this. Honestly, I've been at CNSC hearings where a hush has fallen over the room where, because somebody has said something so shocking that, that the room just goes quiet. And that's what happened 
at this meeting. It's like, I think everybody in the room was stunned, except for the guy who said it, because he obviously knows that. That in other words, yes, yeah, suck it up, everybody. You're on your own. Then the idea that it can't happen here, a, a lot of people argue about the cause of the Fukushima 3 meltdowns. And I never go for the earthquake or the tsunami. Mm -mm. It's station blackout which could happen at any, not just a nuclear plant, but a lot of nuclear facilities Absolutely. cannot survive a loss of power to cool the processes, yep. uh, whether in enrichment or, or the plants themselves or storage of hot waste or, or whatever. But um, that A nuclear could happen accident anywhere. can happen anywhere. Yeah. Absolutely, it can happen anywhere. And, and a favorite, I bring this up too much, but, uh, you know, a while back, a CBC headline was, you know, Point Le Pro has 17 fires in its previous license period. And that right there is a, a, a little wow. quote I can't get over. And I'm sure they were minor fires. But still, this yikes. is the kind of thing that goes on. That's a yikes. And you'd think the job one would be to prevent any of them. But 17, in it, and obviously the previous license period was maybe over the course of a few years, but still. How many fires do you have at home? <laughs> My eyebrows are still up because yeah. of the 17 fires. I mean... I'm flabbergasted. That's CBC. Yeah. Don't, don't look at me. Well, one of the things about nuclear emergency planning is other countries are doing things differently now. Switzerland is, you know, really stepping up to the plate and they're doing some modeling around things that need to be done in case there's a severe accident an INS, INES level seven, I guess, um, which we're not doing in Ontario. We have not done in the past, and it looks like we're still not doing it. So there's been a lot of pressure on the government uh, in the last couple of years. This is one of the things DNA has worked on, Durham Nuclear Awareness worked on out in Durham region. We've talked to politicians. They've passed any number of resolutions asking for better nuclear emergency planning. There was, there was a lot of input to the province last year on this, on this PNERP review that was done, the Provincial Nuclear Emergency Response Plan Review. And the City of Toronto, for example, you know, the City Council, the Toronto City Council said to the province of Ontario, we want better nuclear emergency planning. The province has been told, the province has been told by a lot of people, we want better nuclear emergency planning. Where's and my KI pills? You just yeah. told me I'm closer to the plants than a lot of people in Durham region. Where are my KI pills? Well, that's a good point. I have this <clears throat> lovely little handout that I wish everybody in Toronto would see. You know, it's uh, about ordering your KI pills. Everybody mm -hmm. in Toronto should be ordering them. Mm -hmm. And you can order them at preparetobesafe.ca. And it's because it's up to us to prevent That's right. injury from... These should be pre-distributed. In fact, there's another thing I should have printed. The Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission sent out this amazing message, and that would be the fall of 2014. They just decreed that the nuclear plants had to do this pre-distribution of KI pills within 10 kilometers of the plants. Mm -hmm. This is a thing that takes a minute to explain. I don't know if I should go into this. It just blew my mind. But you have to, is this the one where you have to go to the plant to get the pills during an accident? No. <laughs> no, it's, it's what the CNSC, the way they handled notifying the public about this new regulation. And I, and I could back up and explain that the only reason they made the regulation was because of all the public pressure mm -hmm. at the various hearings and, you know, submissions from the public leading up to that. But on the Friday of a Thanksgiving weekend, I have to think about this. Anyway, I think it was 2014. So the Friday of Thanksgiving weekend, they make an announcement. Those of us on the CNSC information list, you know, we get these messages from CNSC. And so I found out late in the day, I think, I think, yeah, I was going away for the weekend a reporter somebody tried to get in touch with me to talk to me about this okay so they first of all that's a strategy releasing things at you know like three or four o'clock on the friday of a long weekend you're trying to get around the media you're trying to get around this getting into the news so that was number one they did that and they didn't succeed because there was media coverage on it um 
So that's Friday. So there is some media coverage on, you know, the weekend and on the Monday. And then on the Tuesday, they send out another info at CNSC message. And it's about how distribution of KI pills should very likely be taking place in a wider radius. But that's when the attention was off again. So the first notice comes out on Friday afternoon of a long weekend, so the media won't cover it, they hope. And then days later, they release this message saying, you know, probably the KI pills should be going out in a wider geographical area. It's just nuts. But yes, so it's up to us apparently to ask for these damn pills. They should be pre-distributed within, anyway, I mean, I've got a handout on that. I've got a handout from the American Thyroid Association and they say uh, the pills should probably be pre-distributed within, I think they say 50 miles. So, and you see, this takes place at OPG expense. The KI pills are an OPG expense. So, of course, OPG doesn't want to pay for this. They don't want to pay for the pre-distribution of KI pills to a really large population because that would be very costly. But that's what they should be doing, you know. So... Yeah, there's just, you know, there's just so much wrong, you sort of don't know where to. And again, I would just repeat the fact that Ontario Power Generation knows perfectly well there could be a nuclear accident at their sites. Otherwise, why would they be having on-site nuclear emergency drills five times a year? They know an accident is possible. So, it can't happen here? Well. Find us on Twitter, at That Archer. Our podcast page tmi.twxnet.com. Rate the show on iTunes. It changes the way the show is listed. North of the 401, you know, you were seeing lots of green of trees and definitely the plant was not there. The plant is never featured in anything on the City of Pickering website. Um, So I refer to it as the invisible nuclear plant because you can't see it. And look what they've done out at Darlington. They've got this great big berm. They're just building up all like this big berm so that you can't see the plant from the highway. Yeah, they were on that from day one. But it's getting more invisible. The berm is getting bigger. So I I wanted to ask earlier, um, some people argue that we should have cooling towers. Mm. And maybe it's better, maybe it's worse, maybe... um, Maybe they can use a couple gallons less water with cooling towers from the lake than they would without them. But and obviously it would be a huge eyesore. But it's hard. To, you can't really. That'd be a big hill. You can't have ignore to. <laughs> the cooling towers, can you? They make it very visible. Hmm. Yeah. No, we want to have our invisible nuclear plants. That's the way it's designed to be. And you know. These are two really big nuclear facilities. Yeah, nobody and has right eight. close to each other. They're I think they're thirty kilometers away from one another, hmm. and they're in Toronto's backyard. Well, and right in their we're, backyard, we're the only country that's stupid enough to have this kind of reactor all connected to each other, yeah. all in a row. Mm-hmm. I said this to somebody. Oh well, you know the Japanese have multi-reactor sites, but apparently each one of those reactors are in their own buildings. It's only Canadians who are dumb enough to have them all joined to each other, connected to each other, and codependent on some safety safety system. Yep. I mean, so we're crazier than the Japanese. The yep. Americans don't do that. Yeah, most most new plants in the states are not anywhere near the size of ours. They don't have nearly as many reactors. And the reactors aren't all in the same under the same roof essentially. Yeah, and it's pretty crazy are, what we got going here. Yeah, it's well, who, yeah. And the Bruce plant, I've heard it said repeatedly that the Bruce nuclear plant is the biggest nuclear plant on the planet. Mm. That's what I hear people say. I don't know whether it's true or not, but that's what I hear. I think there's a couple big ones in Japan, but I think um I don't know what the difference was if they uh didn't have the same number of reactors or they were again in se- under separate roofs and certainly you might say in the biggest operating plant because I think the big one in Japan there it was only in the news recently because they're threatening to open it again. Well, it's making a lot of money for the province, and I I really don't understand that. 
you know, I mean, those those two. How can those, it be making money for the province? Well, they sell electricity for a lot of money. I don't know. I don't understand the finances but, of it. But this I, is, I really don't understand this that. This is a, a bone I pick, and that's like, it's terrific up until you figure out what costs you include and which ones you don't include when you say it's profitable for anyone. Yeah, well, the salaries they pay alone. I mean, nobody at these nuclear plants makes less than 100 grand a year. They're paying well, a was, We're going to bring up, look, the sunshine list is right on my list of things to talk yeah, about. It's, it's a big deal, that sunshine list. I think these um, little marinas dot along the uh, Ontario shoreline, I think a lot of OPG people have boats. Just say. Oh, well, they, they don't just have boats. They I'm sure they have mansions and, you know, four-car garages and so on. We're talking very big salaries well, for some of these but people. But I'm very, still very ticked big off at what you said, making money for the province. Because, well, because largest corporate loss in the history of our species anywhere ever, Ontario Hydro, it's bankruptcy. The stranded debt, which has been split up and redefined and shoveled around. These refurbs, I don't know who's paying for them, let me guess. Uh, the nuclear waste never got a price tag associated with it. The low-level, intermediate A, intermediate B, high-level, what they're doing with the refurb materials. Um, I, I argue building wings of universities now, I bet that's not included in the cost of, because right we have to train all those. Well, egg remember eggs. I said the tail wags the dog. You yeah. have to always remember the tail wags the dog. So I'm not saying any of it makes sense. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it makes sense. Okay, in New Brunswick, they've got one nuclear reactor. New Brunswick Power, I've just been told recently, represents fifty percent of the province's debt. Wonder how that pans out here in Ontario. Yeah, you know who would know that is Jack Gibbons from the Ontario Clean Air Alliance. He's so up on all the economic aspects of things. The reason that I was saying that it makes money for the province, uh, I've heard a U.S. anti-nuclear colleague say that some of the plants, but it's different in the States, you see, because they're privately owned. They're private corporations that own those. There's Entergy and there's whatever down there. Whereas in Ontario, it's a provincial whatever. But those plants make a million dollars a day. Some of them make a million dollars a day selling energy. So it's a lucrative business for them. I don't understand how it works in Ontario because of the fact that it's a provincial thing. and It's very complicated I trying to figure out the American situation. We actually have a slight advantage because it is government owned. But in the United States, the funding of it all is so blurred mm -hmm. by bonds, by... Um, having the rate payers pre-invest in it. Uh, and it's a lot harder to figure out who's, get, who's getting what. And then mm -hmm. there's an artificial price set for the electricity. And then we're back to the same issue. The costs, the real hidden and or deferred costs are not included in the price yeah. of electricity they're selling for. So it's this really tough argument. What is coming up for Durham Nuclear Awareness? Well, there's the Pickering hearing towards the end of June. I think I've got that month right, and I may have it wrong because there was supposed to be a Chalk River hearing at the end of June, and I may be confusing. There's also a the deadline for submissions, and, and so it, it complicates. But it's coming up May or June. Yes. I've, yep, that's right. And... I think it's great if people do take part, if they learn more about it. Um, Durham Nuclear Awareness, we have a brochure, we have a website, durhamnuclearawareness.com. People are welcome to visit that. I certainly need to be putting more, uh, more work into the website. And there will be, and I need to do a revised brochure as well. I, I have a brochure, brochure here, and it's on the Durham Nuclear Awareness website. People can find it. This... This brochure, even though it's out of date at this point and needs to be updated, it does have, um, our brochure has some great quotes in it. It has some uh, resources you can consult beyond nuclear, the Canadian Environmental Law Association, Greenpeace, our site, Fairwinds, um, 
and there will be information on the site in the days ahead on the, the hearing. The brochure will also be updated. And the more people learn, the better, the more people who pay attention to the hearing. One of the things about the hearings, particularly this hearing actually, the Pickering hearing, that hearing will be held in Pickering at the recreation complex, very likely. It's very easy to attend that. Uh, you can even this get is all, very can, rare because usually they yeah. hold these. Well, the Darlington ones are always out in the boonies where it's not, It's it, well, it's, I don't know if it's absolutely impossible to get there by public transit, but it's very challenging. The Pickering hearing that's coming up, on the other hand, will be very easy to get to by public transit. You hop on the GO train if you want to. I mean, you can drive there. It's easy to get there. Pickering's not far from Toronto. But you can go on the GO train, and you can even walk from the GO station over to the Pickering Recreation Complex. Wow. Might be Is 10 minutes. Is that rare that they make them that accessible? Yeah. I've the always Pickering... joked they should have them at Kensington Market here in Toronto, yeah. and half a million people would show up. Absolutely. I remember there was a GE hearing in Toronto a couple of years ago. It wasn't a hearing technically, it was a meeting. It wasn't a hearing, it was a meeting. It was held somewhere in North York that was really challenging to get to. Yeah, it's, it's deliberate. I think it's pretty deliberate. But What specifically is the subject of that hearing? Relicensing. The current license that OPG has for the Pickering plant, it expires at the end of August in 2018. And they're asking for... Uh, ten-year license. So they they're saying they want to run the plant until 2024, and then they'll begin to decommission. So they're asking for a renewed license. Obviously, I'd like to see them not get that license. There's people who uh, talk about the uh, runtime hours of the parts of that plant and how you know they were limited, and they'll be at the edge of that. Maximum, oh, they're already running them past or their... Or exceeding it. Yeah, they're past their... And as usual, so when they exceed something, they say, oh, well, we've been underestimating what usage for, yeah. Yeah, and they claim that they've checked however many of the tubes and this and that, and, you know, it's fine, but it's not really true. I mean, it's like a car. Would you run your car? I mean, don't you know that your car, after a certain number of years, is going to have more problems in it? These nuclear plants, Pickering has been running since, is it 71, I mm. think, that plant's been running? Old parts, multiple problems. The older it gets, you know, the easier it's going to be for something to go wrong. And it's always man-made. I mean, it's always a human problem that causes nuclear accidents, right? You don't... Yeah. Some and, people and take exception with the original design of the plant. Oh, yes. Let alone. You could you could do several podcasts with people to speak about that alone. Mm. You know, the problems with the can-do reactors. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a technical person, so I'm not the right person to talk to about that. But there are people who know about the, the issues with the, the can-do plants. And, yeah. But anyway, if, if you get involved in a hearing, if you choose to become involved, you can attend... You can sit and listen to the many expert people. The, it's incredible the expertise that comes from the members of the public. We're talking lots of PhDs, some MDs, um, well-educated members of the public. Most you know. of, of my learning has come from studying these hearings. Oh, it's unbelievable the expertise, the knowledge. Unbelievable. Yeah. I always say it's very easy to see where the real knowledge in the room lies, and it's not with the supposed nuclear experts or the nuclear regulator. It's the very, very well-educated members of the public. The problem with CNSC hearings is that, and I've been attending them, as I mentioned earlier, since 2006. I don't mean I've been to every single CNSC hearing since 2006, but I've been to a lot. been to ones in Ottawa, Pembroke, Port Hope, um, Pickering, Darlington, several Pickering and Darlington hearings. But the public is largely not there. They're not aware the hearings are taking place. They're, you know, the average citizen person on the street in Pickering, for example, the hearing, well, I could name the hearing that happened in 2013 at the Pickering Recreation Complex. You know, people within half a mile of the hearing, they don't know what's happening. They don't know that hearing's taking place. They're, they're a really well-guarded secret. It's very few people. It's a very, very tiny percentage of the population that is paying attention to that. 
The press doesn't cover it usually. There's not a lot of media coverage. There are various websites people could check to find out when the hearing's going to be. Our site, DurhamNuclearAwareness.com, will have information about it. Who else? The Greenpeace um, website, I'm sure, will have information about it. Canadian Environmental Law Association will. Who else? Norwatch. Northwatch will be there. Um, yeah, so the information is there. One thing people can do if they want to is get on the CNSC information list. I mean, look it up. Look it up their website, you know, Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. And they have, on their main page, they have a thing about hearings, upcoming hearings. And you can, first of all, you can check for those hearings. And if you want to, you can get on the email list for their messages. You'll probably get way too many messages. We do get a lot of messages. And I don't process, I don't mentally process every single message I get from the CNSC. Because some of it is about a mine. Yeah. I don't pay attention to every single message. But I certainly hear about you know, hearings and stuff like that on that list. So so people are welcome to attend the hearings. They don't have to intervene if they don't want to. They don't have to make a presentation, but they can attend. Bring your own snacks. Yeah. <laughs> the one thing about the Pickering Recreation Complex is it is within easy walking distance of the big mall in Pickering. I can't remember the name of the mall. I'm not very good about malls. What is that mall called? I don't remember what it's called. This sounds like a fun outing, actually. (laughs) Easy to get to. Hop on the GO train, get off in Pickering, walk over to the Pickering Recreation Complex. You will walk right by that great big mall that I just mentioned. So you can actually go over there for a cup of coffee or a meal if there's break time. Maybe people should bring the whole family. Absolutely. Bring Bring your family, bring your kids. I became friends with somebody once who came to a, I believe it was a Darlington hearing, and I was blown away by the quality of this person's presentation. And I contacted her later, and we're really good friends now. When she came to that hearing, I'd never met her before, but she came, and she had her husband with her and her kids. And, yeah, people should people should find out. Because the thing about CNSC hearings, and I've been saying this for a really long time, you don't have to sit in a hearing room for more than 10 or 15 minutes. If, you're, if your mind is fairly sharp, you're going to start catching how this all goes on, and it's pretty amazing. You kind of go, your head's going back and forth at the exchanges and going, wow, did, did that person really just say that? And, you, you know, you notice stuff like the fact that the the proponent, say Ontario Power Generation, gets an infinite amount of time to spew whatever they feel like saying. But the public interveners get their very short 10 minutes, and most people are not asked questions. Some are. but um, And when it's time for the CNSC or the proponent to answer questions, they sound like an evasive politician. Yes, and they use a lot of jargon, and they always use the word robust. Mm. I'm absolutely convinced that robust is the key number one word for people in the nuclear industry. They Mm. always say things are robust. The plant is robust. The emergency planning is robust. The The cost overruns are robust. (laughs) Well, that's what I like to do sometimes. And I like to say that nuclear waste is very, very robust indeed. Nuclear waste will be with us a very, very, very long time. It's very robust. So, yeah, the hearings are quite something to see. And... uh, I advise people to consider attending because this you're already is... you're prepaid for them. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. It is all covered by taxpayers' dollars for sure. Now, here's another thing that it's really good for people to understand about Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission itself and its hearings. The proponents, the nuclear operators like OPG, pay licensing fees to the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, and I. Pretty sure if I'm not very good with numbers, but I remember there was there was a CNSC person who spoke at a Pickering. There was a town council meeting. When would that be? December last, uh, December 2016. There was a Pickering council meeting that some CNSC people were at, and a number of people from the public were speaking to the Pickering council about their concerns about the Pickering reactors. I think I had raised it. I'd suggested that this was an issue to consider, that CNSC receives a lot of its funding from the operators. And it's 70%, apparently. They receive 70... CNSC receives 70% of its operating funds from the operators. 
So what that means is the CNSC is almost like an employee of the nuclear industry. So They're they have no interest in shutting down the plants because they derive their income from the operation of the plants. So I always thought it was interesting that the CNSC is housed in the ministry responsible for the export of uranium. Mm -hmm. I also thought it was interesting that in the end, all our live online radar or our live online seismic data is actually through the Ministry of Natural Resources, who also houses the CNSC. And even yes. Binder himself, although this was theater, asked, well, why can't the public get real-time radionuclide data? Monitoring data. Mm -hmm. And you can, but you can only get it in chunks by the quarter, and it's all averaged, averaged out. out. But we never see the spikes. And yep. you, you just said, oh, it's the responsibility of the public to protect themselves against uh, radiation. Well, that's and what the guy from Osmond said. We yep. can't mitigate. Like, if you knew that there was going to be a big tritium release, because there are large tritium releases, and I'll bet you they know when they're going to happen. Absolutely. And you can't keep Johnny in out of the rain on that day. So we don't even get the right to mitigate our own exposure. No. When we can, because we, one, aren't informed before time of uh, increased emissions as a result of refueling or uh, emissions as a result of regular releases of tritium. Um, we can't see when there are spikes. Uh, it's all kept from us, and yet we're paying for all that monitoring equipment. We're paying. Paying to so poison ourselves. But we're paying them to keep the information from us. You know what a lot of people down in the U.S. are doing? I've been to some conferences down in the U.S. with, you know, various groups in attendance at these conferences. And what people are doing in a lot of places in the States is they're doing their own monitoring. Mm -hmm. And that's what we really need. I've wished for some time, I guess what I've wished for a lot of years is that I could clone myself so I could do all the things I'd like to really be able to do. One of the things I'd like to do is somehow get people in Ontario around the, the uh, plants in Durham region to, to start doing independent monitoring. Okay, well, a, a future guest, um, and AJ mentioned it when I've had him on previous episodes, I think it's called the Nano Geige or something like that, and it's a device that goes online and when you turn it on it gives the real-time counts per minutes of wherever you're traveling in and puts it on a map and wow. the end there's a whole planet of few people with this device and you can see um, public generated radiation uh, data hmm. and so a lot of people in Japan you can obviously yeah apparently uh, there's not a lot of people who have this device in Ontario, so you can basically tell where this guy travels in Ontario because his is the only one posting data. I wonder data. who it is. I probably... Louis, Louis Bertrand. Bertrand. Yeah. He's got one, a nano Does he? He's going to okay. come on in a few oh, weeks. Oh, good. Good. Oh, Great. Because yeah. I know he's hooked in with this program called SafeCast, I think, where... I think that's what yeah, it that's reports Yeah, that's what I'm thinking to. about that's happening down in the well, States. Well, the device is called a Nano Geige, and it's this small, very cool device. And when you turn it on, it posts uh, radiation data online and puts it on a map. And Louis knows how to build one of these, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, he's a professor yeah. of... Uh, yeah. Technology. Yeah, it would be great to have more monitoring. Um, the thing is, what can you do about it? I guess you can keep Junior in... Keep your kids inside if there's... Well, presumably if enough of these people had that device and if the government, the American government and the Canadian government, uh, who suspended uh, a lot of the public uh, data not long after Fukushima, uh, now we can have... Um, what do they call it when it's, you know, it's not open source, but it's citizen-sourced data. Um, you yeah. know, and I mean, so you know when there's a spike. I mean, yeah. one of the patterns here is that something happens and the public is in it the last to know. Mm -hmm. 
even the recent Ruthenium 106. Mm-hmm. We still don't know what plant exactly. Nobody's chimed in to. Oh, take I this think watch. the Russians finally admitted that it was. The Mukiak? The, I can't remember. Mayak? Uh, Mayak, whatever. Yeah. 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 They do reprocessing there yeah. or something. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's. There are things people can do. The thing about activism always, just in general, you know. There's always room for whatever a person's talent is or Mm. their inclination is. So some people write, some people are good at art and they can do things with art. Some people are very technical and they can do things, you know, there's, if people are interested in this, there's always some way in which you can make a contribution. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah. yeah. So it's not for everybody to go to a hearing, but maybe maybe you could go listen to the hearing or... It's not for everybody to write articles. Maybe they do a podcast. <laughs> it's not for everybody to yeah. make a web page, but maybe they go on social media. Or yep. it's not everybody's thing with the computers. Maybe they bring it up at the dinner table. Mm-hmm. The more it's talked about. That's one of the things that I say, actually. I harp on this is uh, get people talking. You know, it's sort of like, shh, I have this agenda, which is get people talking. Get people talking. The more people talk about whatever the issue is, it doesn't have to be nukes, whatever issue. I, you know, I've worked on so many different issues, and uh, yeah, just get people talking, get people paying attention. Okay. Well, there's something about our culture. We're fragmented. Mm-hmm. The internet, although it's informed us all, in a way, you know, now I can go online and hang out with other people who like to dress like in giraffe outfits. Uh, and on one hand, that's great, but now we're I'm busy wearing my giraffe outfit, and I'm not keeping track of Trump or Trudeau or nuclear or lead or yeah. So in one way, we're now now more distracted, we're fragmented, and you know you see people in the streets with their phone; they can't cross the road without reading a text or something. Um, you know, I mean, some people will argue, well, actually, now you never know. That person crossing the road might be reading about nuclear. You don't know. They could also be looking for, some, you know, 20 points. A good in, cat in some, video. A good cat video. <laughs> no, I wonder, honestly. I mean, mm-hmm. I have a cell phone, but I, I don't have to look at it every minute. And I wonder sometimes. I was just thinking today at one point. I saw somebody walking along, you know, looking at the phone and laughing and i thought cat video like why can't people disconnect from those devices talk more you know people need to talk more i mean we've really were i don't know if atomizing is the right phrase but we're dividing ourselves into smaller and smaller and smaller bits this is what i mean by fragmented Mm -hmm. and the silo thing you know we're all in these different silos so well, you know. the news, it's another thing. So, the, uh, you know, this is a pattern I see continuing. Um, so, you know, 30 years ago, we only had a few channels, Walter Cronkite and a couple other uh, people. And so, you know, you argue, well, that wasn't a high point in journalism because the sources were, were so narrow. But on one hand, we were all on one page often. When it when was the th- wrong page when often, a subject but, did come yeah. through once in a while, we'd at least all be on the right page or the same page. Now we can pick the flavor of news we want to pay attention to, and we're so fragmented that even if a, a upswelling of something occurred, knowledge-wise, we're so fragmented we we we're actually worse off in some ways. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Agreed. And so how would you rattle people out of their, their cell phones and, and into the issues? On the other hand, you know, and I don't know that this is going to happen, but, you know, at one point there were these swarm events where a bunch of young people will get wind of something that doesn't make sense and they all show up out front of Hydro One to protest their yeah, source of electricity. I think that's totally um, fun and doable. One of the things about activism that a lot of people don't realize is it's fun. Mm-hmm. It's actually fun. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've met the most utterly fantastic people in all the years I've been an activist. I wouldn't have missed it for the world. Mm-hmm. We don't always quote, you know, win our issue, but we learn a lot of stuff. We meet great people. 
And we do change things. Not in a big way, maybe. In some small ways. For you example, never know sometimes. Yeah, one of the issues that I was involved with, one of the nuclear issues that I was involved in early on, was the steam generator issue. Bruce Power was proposing to ship radioactive steam generators through the Great Lakes and up the St. Lawrence I and across that. the ocean to Sweden. And that was eventually defeated because of an incredible coalition of activists from both, you know, both Canada and the U.S., and uh, the work that was done on that, unbelievable. And the expertise brought to bear, lawyers involved, you know, various groups in Canada and the U.S. And uh, they did not ultimately ship those steam generators. That was Janet McNeil of Durham Nuclear Awareness. She is that organization's coordinator. Janet has been an advocate for responsible public policy for at least 30 years. Janet McNeil spoke to us in our Toronto studio. Find us on Twitter at That Archer, our podcast page, tmi.twxnet.com. Rate the show on iTunes. And for your information... There is no collusion. I'm Dave Archer. And I'm Janet McNeil from Toronto, Ontario.